In 2001, a British economist who was at the time the chairman of asset management at Goldman Sachs, Jim O'Neill, coined the acronym BRIC, B-R-I-C, to refer to Brazil, Russia, India, and China, four countries he considered to be at approximately equal spots in terms of their economic development. They were all newly advanced, as we typically measure such things, and thus, because of their size and potential for growth, they were also worth watching, as they could someday usurp the top-placed positions of contemporarily far wealthier, far more advanced, again, as we tend to economically measure such things, nations like the US, UK, Japan, Australia, and so on. Eight years later, in 2009, the leaders of this, until this point, purely theoretical group held a BRIC summit, formalizing what until then had been a useful term, but not an actual thing. And from that point forward, they became a real deal block of nations that aimed, in their words, to challenge the existing world order, which in many ways is run by those aforementioned wealthier nations. They wanted to create a multipolar system that would have more than one central geopolitical aggregation of influence and leverage. These four nations unto themselves represented about 40% of the world's population and 15% of the world's GDP. And they aimed, among other things, to work together as a cooperating block within other organizations like the G20 and United Nations to begin that reorientation toward multipolarity. They were also keen to help wean the world off the USD, the US dollar, which has long been, since World War II, central to global trade. Most countries using it for all kinds of exchanges between themselves, even if the US is not involved. This was a key demand made by the Russian government when it entered the bloc, which has been especially keen to do less business in USDs for pretty much ever. Several other countries, including those that make up most of Central Asia and the Middle East, were granted observer status in this new organization. And in late 2010, South Africa was formally accepted into the core group, and BRIC became BRICS, which was also an acronym coined by O'Neill nearly a decade earlier, though in his coining it was BRICS with a lowercase s, as South Africa was a good addition but smaller in both population and economic heft compared to the other members. This new formalization of BRICS, though, gave South Africa a more polite and equal uppercase S. So South Africa did not add much in terms of population to the group's numerical accolades, bringing just 50 million people to the block, making the total collective population of BRICS about 3.21 billion people as of 2019. But it does have a pretty strong economy at this economic tier, and is one of the top economies by many metrics in Africa, a continent that would otherwise be unrepresented by this bloc. So after their introduction, that left only North America, in terms of nation-state hosting continents, as being unrepresented in BRICS. Since the formation of this group, the member nations have worked to reform the IMF and World Bank, to provide more power to nations not currently topping the global economic charts. They formed the New Development Bank, based out of China, which is intended to funnel money to struggling components of the BRICS bloc. They've held a bunch of summits, and they've proposed plans to build undersea internet cables between member nations, which would help allay fears that the US and its allies are able to tap the communications of countries around the world via existing cables, though no construction has begun on such new infrastructure as of mid-2023. What I'd like to talk about today is what's happening with BRICS currently, as the bloc expands its roster, and consequently, perhaps, its influence, headed into 2024. <laughs> You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you are enjoying what you hear, please consider becoming a supporter. You can do so at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also become a member at understandry.com. Becoming a financial supporter of this podcast via either of these methods gains you access to an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free version of the show. A huge thanks to everyone who's already helping to support Let's Know Things, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, 
Let's get back to the show. In late August of 2023, BRICS representatives announced that the bloc had agreed to accept six new nations, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Ethiopia, Egypt, Argentina, and the United Arab Emirates, into the group. This increase, which is the first in about 13 years since South Africa was brought into the fold, more than doubles the number of nations involved, and the announcement left room for more entrants in the future, basically saying they intended to keep expanding, making it likely that this is just the first of a series of planned BRICS expansions in the coming years. And dozens of other countries have already expressed interest in joining if and when the opportunity arises, with more than 20 having been formally keen to join this time around, asking to do so but not accepted quite yet. This new batch of national members will formally join the group on January 1st, 2024, and its composition gestures at a pivot in strategy for BRICS, which will apparently, for now at least, continue to be called BRICS, though the name might change at some point in the future to account for this change in national composition. So while BRICS originally consisted almost entirely of nations with huge populations, large land masses, and burgeoning economies, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are both relatively small nations in terms of people, but they have great wealth thanks to their fossil fuel industries. Argentina is a perennially struggling nation in terms of its economy, but it's an influential force in South and Central America and a tight ally and neighbor of Brazil's, while Egypt is one of the wealthiest nations in Africa and has great diplomatic relations with Russia and India, while also serving as a sort of linchpin economy and government and military in the North Africa and Middle East regions. Iran is likewise a potent force in its neck of the woods, one of the two power loci alongside Saudi Arabia in the Middle East, both in terms of its economy and population, and in terms of its military. And Ethiopia, though much smaller in terms of population and economy than most of the other members, is considered to be a hotbed for growth, especially if it can get some regional conflicts it has been suffering from for years under control and especially by mid-century, once it's had a chance to enjoy some of that theoretical stability. So this expansion significantly updates BRICS' geopolitical influence, its reach, both in terms of demographics and in terms of the raw territory it spans, its decades in the future potential, and maybe even relationships between some of its members beyond the scope of the bloc. There are tensions between many of these member states, though, that have already reduced the impact the group is able to have on global goings-on, and which could limit their capacity to achieve certain ends moving forward as well. One of the primary motivations for investing in and expanding this group for China and Russia is to shift the world away from a US and Europe-dominated international order, which tends to, in many ways, favor the loosely defined West. That favor manifests through diplomatic relationships, the way monetary systems work, the priorities of democratic governance, and a slew of other framework-reinforced nudges that allow those at the top of the economic food chain to, in general, tweak things in small and large ways in favor of their preferred method of governing and doing business. Fundamental to this favoritism is the USD's primacy as the intermediary global trade currency, which accounted for an estimated 96% of trade in the US, 74% in the Asia-Pacific region, and 79% across the rest of the world in 2021, according to the US Federal Reserve. That's a lot, and that grants the US certain powers, including the ability to manage and tweak the systems via which this trade takes place, in some cases. It also gives the US government more leverage in establishing and enforcing sanctions, which has been a key weapon in its non-military arsenal since the Cold War. So China and Russia, a rising power and by many metrics a flagging one, respectively, and both of which have tensions with the US and its allies, are keen to get an alternative collection of rails and other financial systems in place, helping them and those they want to deal with avoid those Western-aligned systems as much as possible, eventually, maybe, helping them do without the USD entirely, making those sanctions a lot less potent and possibly even completely impotent at some point. That aspect of the bloc is appealing to Iran as well, as its economy has been severely hobbled by U.S. sanctions for years due to its pursuit of a nuclear program against the U.S.'s wishes. But other nations, 
including Brazil and Argentina and other governments that happily deal with the US in general, would love to see alternatives that they can use as well, not being super keen on Western dominance of such systems because of the loose control that provides those running those systems over how they govern and manage their economies. That said, some of the tensions in this group originate with opposition to these sorts of efforts, as some want to take a bigger slice of the existing pie within the established order, in part by creating alternatives that play well with what's already there, rather than replacing that existing order wholesale. Brazil, for instance, has rejected the idea of forming a counter to the Western Group of Seven or G7 wealthy countries, instead hoping to deal with them on a more even playing field. So there are ideological conflicts within this still relatively small group that make it tricky to move forward collectively to pursue big picture outcomes in a unified way. Traditional, non-economic animosities could keep this group from achieving as much as they would like to, though. Saudi Arabia and Iran have been at each other's throats for decades, and though there's been a slight warming in their relationship, the Saudi government reopened its embassy in Iran after seven years, for instance, in early August, and the Iranian government has done the same in Saudi Arabia. But these governments and their people are still far from being bosom buddies. Similarly, India and China have a long history of border conflicts, which in some cases over the past few years have become violent and even fatal. These tensions continue to simmer and have played a role in India's strong alignment with the West, the Indian government contributing to efforts to keep the South China Sea from falling completely into China's hands. It has also been increasing its role as a counterweight to China's economic, military, scientific, cultural, and geopolitical influence in Southeast Asia more broadly, efforts that China, needless to say, is not thrilled about. In a 2021 interview, acronym Coiner O'Neill noted that the performance of the BRICS nations has been severely uneven, with Russia and Brazil lagging far behind, South Africa still not doing a whole lot of note beyond its relatively positive performance compared to other African nations, while China and India have both soared. He then said, quote, perhaps I should have called this club the IC for India and China, or just the C, end quote. That conflict between India and China then, all by itself, could keep this bloc from making the big moves that China and Russia and now Iran hope to see. But those other issues could also slow their role toward building the relationships and systems required to pave an opposing or even just parallel economic track to the one that predominates today. While the addition of these and potentially other nations in the future makes BRICS more of a force in terms of population and economic heft, now claiming about 29% of the world's total GDP, the increasing complexity from the added members and all the baggage any nation will inherently bring to such a network of nations could make the bloc more unwieldy and dispersed rather than more focused, giving it more overall leverage but less of a cohesive vision and thus more and more varied targets at which that leverage will be aimed. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. Folks who do so at patreon.com slash let's know things or understandery.com gain access to an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free version of the show. A huge thanks to everyone who's already supporting Let's Know Things. You are the reason I'm able to produce these free episodes each week, and for that, I am truly grateful. The book I'd like to recommend today is called Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma by Claire Detterer. This is a very challenging book, not in the sense that it's difficult to read, but because it challenges our sense of what it means to be a fan, of what it means to celebrate great work, of what it means to have heroes and people that we consider to be great people, no matter what space they happen to be operating in. It's a challenge we're all familiar with, probably at least superficially, when somebody you look up to and who you respect for something that they have done or accomplished or the way they do things does something horrible. And you find out later that they've done something horrible, or you've always known they've done something horrible but you still can't help but respect some other aspect of that person. Some film that they created, an album that they made, something that they've done with their career, typically, that then has to coexist uncomfortably 
with something that they've done as human beings. This book tackles that concept of what it means to be a fan of the work created by monsters, and thus it is a difficult read, but it's also good grist for the mill. It's a really excellent excuse to look deeper into this concept and to think more ardently and specifically about some of the people that we respect personally. Now, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma by Claire Dederer. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other news-centric podcast, One Sentence News, wherever you get your pods or at onesentencenews.com. And please feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram and threads, and just Colin Wright on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.